I want you to open your Bible with me to Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. So this is speaking of a vision that Ezekiel is having of what's going to happen in the future. He's seeing a vision of this temple and from the temple the water is flowing towards east. Now for those of us who don't live in that part of the world, east, west, north doesn't mean much. Doesn't mean much. But east is flowing, the temple, the water is flowing toward east. It actually is flowing toward the Dead Sea. In 2017, uh, me and my wife, as well as quite a few people from Hungry Gen, we had a chance to actually go visit Israel. I would encourage every person to visit Israel. And when we went to visit Israel, not only I was surprised with how small Israel is, but we get a chance to go to the Dead Sea. And this is us at the Dead Sea. And then in the Dead Sea, it's interesting because it's one of the most saltiest places on the planet, 30 miles long, 9 miles wide, the shoreline is 1,300 below sea level. So it is actually the lowest point on earth. 7 million tons of water evaporates every day. The salt content is 10 times saltier than the oceans in the world. It's so salty that only bacteria can survive there. You can float, but there is no freshness in there. Nothing lives there. Nothing, no fish, no plants. It's, everything is dead. So we actually tried it. You, it's very difficult to drown there because it's so much saltiness that is there. And if you have any kind of scar or any kind of a wound, it will hurt so bad. And so we went in there, just had a blast, had a wonderful time. And this prophetic picture that, Isaiah, that Ezekiel is seeing is the water is flowing from the temple toward the east. And it's actually... The lowest point on the planet, it's flowing toward the sea. When it says in here, the sea, it's talking about the Dead Sea. And then one day, the day is coming, when the Messiah is coming, there will be a temple and that God will actually revive, I believe, that Dead Sea. And it will no longer be dead. But I want to use the symbol of this today to talk about another temple that we're not waiting to be built in Israel, but God has already built in you. We are temples of the Holy Ghost. Can somebody say amen? amen? We are not tombs of tradition, religion and only good experiences. The Bible calls Christians the temple of the Holy Spirit. This does not mean that just because we are spiritual temple that there will not be the third temple built in Jerusalem. We believe that there will be a third physical temple built in Jerusalem and the Antichrist will defile that temple and the Lord Jesus Christ will come and He will destroy the Antichrist. He will destroy the Antichrist armies and Jesus will sit in that temple and He will be glorified. But until that time, the Bible makes it very clear that today we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. The danger that we have as the temple of the Holy Spirit is to become tombs of religion. When Jesus was on this earth, He rebuked the Pharisees and He called them whitewashed tombs. Now what is the difference between a temple and a tomb? A tomb holds something that used to be alive. A temple hosts someone that is alive. God. Tombs are religious people that remember times when they loved God more than they love Him today. A tomb is when your memories are bigger than your dreams. A tomb is when you live your life always looking back because your best days were behind you and you're just remembering the good old days but those good old days are no longer now and in the future everything is always in the past. Oh, I remember when I was 16 and I encountered God. I went to that summer camp and in that summer camp, man, the Holy Ghost filled me. I spoke in tongues. I was on fire for God. I read three, four, five pages of the Bible every single day. I woke up at five o'clock, man. I was on fire. I led my friends to Jesus. I was Jesus, hashtag Jesus freak. 
But now of course I became a domesticated, calculated, balanced Christian. You know who you are? A tomb. And every Sunday I wash my tomb. I polish it. So that I look good to the outside world, but I feel dead on the inside. I don't have a vision anymore. I'm not on fire anymore. I'm not burning anymore. I lose battle with the blankets every morning. Meaning I sleep instead of praying. I feast instead of fasting. I don't evangelize. No, the world is evangelizing to me. And instead of me winning my friends for Jesus, now I sing the songs they sing. And I am literally being conformed to this world. But man, oh, I can tell you some good old days that I had with God. You stop being a temple. You became a tomb. Water doesn't flow from tombs. Stench comes out of tombs. Water only flows from temples. And my goal today is not to condemn you, but to quicken you and to wake you up and to tell you your spiritual best days are not when you were 16. They're supposed to be now. Your best year with God is supposed to be now. And you're gonna come to Hungry Jan because God wants to quicken your best spiritual year. Not your best financial year, but spiritual year is now. And as your spiritual year, spiritual month is best now, you will see God will take care of your finances. God will take care of your family. God will take care of other things in your life. Can somebody give God a clap offering? <laughs> Yesterday's manna is today's maggots. Yesterday's manna has maggots. God gave Israel manna every day. But there was one principle there. You can't live on yesterday's manna. You can't serve God only on yesterday's experiences. You gotta have fresh manna every day. Fresh word from God regularly. Burning for God regularly. You can't be a person that used to be on fire for God. Any fireplace that used to have fire only has ashes. We are not full of ashes, we're full of fire. And fire is not hype, fire is not enthusiasm, fire is a deep commitment and a drive to love Jesus. It's this thing that you carry inside of you that consumes you. One prophet said, he says, a fire shot up in my bones and I can't be silent. It's when you're burning, your eyes are on fire. It's just like, you know, when you come out of sauna and you come into the normal temperature room and it's like you fumes coming out of you, like, like smoke is coming out of you. Why? Because you're hot. Come on, somebody. We need to redefine what it means to be hot. It's to be on fire for God. Is to be burning for Jesus. I don't want to live of what God did 10 years ago. I don't want to talk about what I did when I was 15 and 14 years of age, coming to prayer, pressing in, putting flyers over my high school because God doesn't want me to live on yesterday's manna. He doesn't want me to live on yesterday's vision, yesterday's victories. He wants to give new victories today, new mercies today, new breakthrough today, fresh vision today, new revival today. Can somebody give God some praise right now? I want to remind you that if Abraham would have lived on yesterday's word, he, could have, he would have killed his son. Let me say that again. If Abraham would have lived on yesterday's word, he would have killed his son. God told Abraham, offer your son as a sacrifice. He goes for a three day journey, brings his son. If Abraham would have said, well, great. God spoke three days ago. I don't need to have a current, consistent relationship with God today. Why? I heard God before. I don't need to hear God today. He would have killed his son. Jesus says Matthew 4 4. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Look at this. That proceeds. It doesn't say proceed it. Proceeds. Meaning God still speaks today. Still speaks today. God, not like the cessationist believe that stop speaking, stop moving. That's not our God. Yesterday, today and forever the same. He still moves today. If you're breathing, God wants to speak. He still leads today. He still does miracles today. He still answers prayer today. God still has things proceeding from His mouth. And the man lives by the word that is proceeding right now 
from God's mouth. We are a church that want to see God today, want to hear God today, live on fire today, live passionate today, have our best sacrifices today, not 10 years ago, have our greatest commitment to the Lord today, not five years ago, because yesterday's manna stinks. Because Pharisees, when Jesus came, revival broke out. Of course, it didn't look like the revival they were used to. What Pharisees only had is what God used to do. And they rejected the God in front of them. They wanted to do things now. That's why Jesus called them tombs. They only had and celebrated, honored revival of yesterday. Criticized revival of today. And they hoped and secretly wished for God to send revival one day. God is bringing revival now. You can be a part of it. Or you can live based on what God did. Oh, in that old grandma's church that I used to go. Oh, when I was in the village, when we grew up, you know, that, that's great. What God did with Moses was great. But Moses is dead. You're alive. God appointed you for this time and for this generation. And the Lord has not abandoned His church. The Lord is still moving in His church. And the Lord wants us to wake up and stop being tombs of dead men bones, washing them every single weekend, but become temples of the Holy Ghost and live on what God wants to do today. Come on somebody. The best breakthroughs. You see what's happening with people today. When they're giving, God is giving breakthrough. When they're praying, God is giving breakthrough. That could be happening to you today. I want to wake you up today, encourage you, to stir you toward the fact you can have your best year with God. You might not have your best year with your finances. That will catch you up. But you can have the best year with God. Oh, but I did that. I tried that. The previous church. Leave that alone. Don't have your memories bigger than your dreams. Don't have your hurts bigger than your hope. Don't have your fear bigger than your faith. Even your own car has a large front windshield and a very tiny rear view mirror. Most Christians live with a large rear view mirror and a small windshield. And they're like Lot's wife going forward looking backwards. This is what he did to me. This is what she did to me. It's not fair. You know, and you're no longer progressing. Why? Because you're stuck in the past. Get unstuck. Your best days are right ahead of you. Everything that you went through was to prepare you for what you're about to get into. God didn't leave you. God didn't abandon you. If you have breath, you have purpose. Some of us, we stopped living when we got hurt. We're only existing. And then 20 years later, they bury us. But for those 20 years, we simply wasted air. Don't waste your life. Live. Dream. Be alive. Don't just exist. You owe it to everybody around you. You were saved by God. Almighty God lives inside of you. Not so that you will waste your years, but so that you will lay your years down and see your best years with God. Maybe if you're looking back at this year and this has been the hardest year. You couldn't control that. But you decide whether it will be your best year spiritually. And it starts with this one decision. I will not live based on what God used to do. I will live to see what God will do today in my life. I'm not too old. I'm not too young. I didn't fail too much. I am not too uneducated. No, I am the right person for this season and my God will use me. If He can use Vlad, He can use me. If He can use her, He can use me. If He can use Moses, He can use me. But I'm a temple, not a tomb. Say this with me. Say, I'm the temple not a tomb. The second thing I want to highlight is out of the temple came the river. See the moment you begin to live of what God is doing now and you get involved, get engaged with it, river will start to flow. 
If you live off yesterday's blessing and you get stuck in there and keep remembering, we need to remember good old days, don't get me wrong. We need to thank God for the, those good old days. We need to take faith from those places. But while we kill lion and the bear, we must understand all of that is a preparation to kill the Goliath. That means that all of what God used to do is to motivate us so God can do more now. God is always moving forward. God is not stuck in the past. God is always progressing. Not necessarily that God is improving and changing, but progressing in this world by using people and moving further all the time with every generation. And this is our generation and this is our time. And God wants to do greater things that He used to do. But we must understand as the water flows from the temple. When you become a person who says, this is going to be my best use spiritually. I am going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to give. I'm going to focus on making this my best year spiritually. God will take care of the stuff that you, it's your best year in other areas of your life. But something will happen right away. The water will flow. What I love about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is a river not a pool. The Holy Spirit is not a reservoir. The Holy Spirit is not a pond. The Holy Spirit is not a jacuzzi. The Holy Spirit is a river. The water flows from the temple. Jesus said in John chapter 4, John chapter 7, He says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Few things you need to keep in mind, write this down. The river has a flow. A reservoir is a storage unit. If you feel like your life has lost a flow, please understand something is broken. Because the Holy Spirit does not make monuments out of us. He makes a movement out of us. When the Holy Spirit comes, a flow comes into your life. You feel like there is a flow. It doesn't mean you always feel there's a success, but you feel that there's a flow in your life. Something is flowing. You're not stuck because he's flowing. Reservoirs are stuck. Rivers produce life. Reservoirs produce death. Rivers produce, they promote life. Reservoir squashes life. Number three, rivers have banks. Rivers are not tsunamis. When we are believing for revival, when we are standing for revival, what some people have an idea for revival is this. It's not a river, but a tsunami. What is a tsunami? Tsunami destroys everything in its wake. It's waves caused by volcanic interruptions from underground. And these big waves come and they not just fill water with the city with water, they destroy everything. Hungry Gen is not a place where we are praying or contending for a tsunami. Meaning a revival where it destroys our schedule. A revival, we're just going to, because some people have this idea. If real revival comes, we will never sleep. We will just be in worship service 24-7. That's a tsunami. A lot of water, but everything dead afterwards. What we're believing is for river. What does this river do? Has banks. You see Columbia River, it promotes life. If the tsunami will come, all of us will be dead. All of our houses will be destroyed. That river, it creates, gives water to irrigation. It helps with trees. It helps with plantation. The river of Ezekiel chapter 47, the Bible says the trees were made alive. The fish were made alive. There was a sense of life that came with it. And this river had banks. The idea that God wants to cause a revival where all the banks are washed. Importance of family is removed. Importance of influencing our society is removed. The importance of good sleep is removed. We don't have time to eat is removed. All the banks are washed and instead we just have this big flood. That is not a biblical revival. Why? Because God doesn't want to violate His own mandate He gave to man, which is to rule the planet. Are there moments where revivals come to certain churches three, four years, non-stop church services, 100%. We are not praying for that. We don't. We want a river that brings life and has banks. No, not a river we control, but a river that brings life. A river that causes us to live our Christian life in revival. Where a revival is not a Sunday night meeting, but a revival is a lifestyle. Where we win souls, we make disciples, we open a home for cell groups, we run businesses that honor God, we give, 
we, we, we elevate the revival in our society as well. We go into our schools. River had banks. So the version of revival for Hungry Gen is not a service every single day. The version of revival is that we raise servants that live for God every single day. River has banks. We're not praying for a tsunami. We are praying and walking in the river. Come on somebody river enters the sea. This river started very small at the bottom of the temple, at the door of the temple. It came out of the temple into the Dead Sea. But it was slow progression. I want you to notice the river flowed out of the temple. It didn't flow into the temple. What does this tell me? Real revival is not when we get everybody to church. Real revival is when we get the whole church to everybody. Real revival is go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Real revival is now when all the world comes to church. Real revival is when the church stops being a destination but it's a gas station. Because in the traditional version of revival where we get everybody to come to church and it's all about a full-time minister on the stage, that version of revival is not complete. It's very important but it's not complete. Biblical version is the water flowing from the temple and the further this water gets, the deeper it gets away from the temple. Churches have become aquariums of exotic fish. We fish in the bathtub. Meaning it's all about getting people to church. But the biblical mandate is to change our world by being transformed first by God. River flows into the sea, which means revival in the church has to become a reformation in the society. Let me say that again and I want you to write this down, put it somewhere on your fridge. Revival in the church has to lead to transformation in the society. If a revival in the church does not wipe away the drugs on the street, we're missing something. If the revival in the church does not enter the school system, we're missing something. If the revival in the church does not reduce the amount of crime that is happening on Friday night, we are missing something. If revival in church does not affect the fact that people are killing their babies and that does not get decreased or brought down, we're missing something. Now some people go in and say, we don't need revival in the church. We just need to change the society. They preach social gospel. But God's model has always been, if my people call by my name. God has always been, if they humble, if they pray, if they get water flowing from the temple, I will heal their land. God's model has always been to revive the church. And that the revived church will begin to by default and intention reform the society. Which means that the church isn't trying to pull people from business, from school, from media, but to say now that you are changed, be the salt and the light in your workplace. Minister is not the one with the microphone. Minister is the one that has a purpose and you can have a purpose in your business. You can have a purpose as a mom raising your children. You can bring reformation to this society when you live in revival in your heart. Thank you for that golf club, uh, golf clap, amen. Revival in the church leads to reformation in the society. Reformation in the society without revival is just enforcing laws and rules. Revival is not top down, it's down up. Jesus didn't go in trying to change the kings, he changed the hearts and send those people into the world. And as more people got changed, they started to occupy positions of politics, media, education, business. And everywhere they went, they started to affect those areas with the saltiness of a Christ-changed life. And instead of pulling away people from the marketplace, we draw people to revival in the church, in the small groups, in prayer, 
but we don't live in revival we live from revival and bring the revival because revival needs to become a reformation why does it be, need to become a reformation because this earth does not belong to the devil God created the heavens of heavens belong to God the earth is given to the sons of men this earth belongs to God's children and God wants us to spread the fame of his name not by force but by lifestyle by the preaching of the good news and the living of the good news everywhere we go that's why you see we're not running from schools we're going into schools we're not waiting on our suitcases still for the rapture no we are working with God to see a revival break out in our homes in our lives we're not asking people quit your business and become a full-time minister if that's what God called you yes we're encouraging you no rethink your business and minister to your business be an influence for God's kingdom for your business because everyone is called to be a minister even those without a spotlight microphone in the stage can somebody say amen give you an example America has experienced those things there was a Fiji revival even though it was short-lived it started as a political violence in Fiji around the year 2000 Fijians they looted and burned Indian stores raped women injured many there was an outbreak of violence there's this guy that was elected La Siniera, and I think I mispronounced his name wrong he was elected and he was a born-again Christian. He saw the racism and the conflict that was happening in his nation, the violence. He came to the pastors and he says, I want you pastors to stop bickering and fighting. Because pastors also, denominations were fighting. He says, I want you to unite together so that we can see revival in the nation. Knowing that revival in the church brings reforma reformation in the society. Pastors started to get together, pray and fast. This guy who was elected as a president his opponent was a Hindu Indian opponent but he lost the election so this new president born again organizes a national meeting where he washes the feet of his opponent right in front of everyone because his opponent was from Indian descent and Fiji's they were attacking Indian people and he was calling for repentance even though he won the election he was calling his nation to repentance and even doing a reconciliation night on night. the Christian. See, he should chose his presidential office not as a place to push religion but to push godly values in his nation. Churches started to organize prayer meetings in villages and three, four, five, seven days fastings in villages. It spread like wildfire for repentance and for revival. People start getting saved. Idols were being burned. They would hold Bible studies every single night confessing their sin. They burned 13,864 plantations of marijuana. They burned about 11 million worth of drugs. They burned idols. This started to spread in such a way where coral reef in the river in the village of Rukua came back to life and actually fish came back. It takes hundreds of years for coral reef to grow. It happened overnight when the villages started to repent. So the nature that groans for the redemption of the sons of God started to experience reformation because revival hit the village. Revival came to the people. Please understand this world needs a revived church. This world does not need a dead church. This world does not need a church that just has big buildings but doesn't have a big heart. This world does not need a church that only remembers what God used to do and is no longer doing anything. When the church gets revived, the world gets reformed. In the documentary, Let the Sea Resound, George Oris Jr said these healing healings both in the land and in people started to happen in villages of Fiji. One village forefather killed and ate a missionary. That's one of the things they used to do is they used to eat people there. So they would kill and eat this missionary. When the village got saved they found out that that was what their ancestors did. They paid for the ticket 
of the victim descendants from England to come back to that village so that they can ask for forgiveness. God started bringing reconciliation. In September 20, 2003, over 100,000 people, 10% of the nation gathered for Rehard Bonke's crusade in that nation. When this repentance, when this revival started with Christians. Revival doesn't wait for the White House to change. Revival waits for your house to change. It's not the White House that controls the destiny. It's the White Throne that controls the destiny. And you have access to it. God didn't say if Joe Biden, God says if my people. God didn't say if Donald Trump becomes a president, God says if my people begin to humble themselves and pray. Meaning you hold the key to the revival in your home. You hold the key to the revival in this church. You hold the key to the change in your society. And that key, my friend, is bending your knees before God. Not staring in front of a TV show or a football game, but getting up early, pressing into God, praying. Because water flows from the temple. And when this water flows from the temple, it goes to the Dead Sea. God wants revival not to stop in the church or flow into the church but flow out of the church into the society, into the school system, into the media, into the business world, into the political arena, every arena. But make no mistake, the change doesn't come from there. The change comes from here. The change comes from the Holy Spirit and it comes from here. You can't impose godliness. Yeah, the laws have to be made to protect and restrain evil. But restraining evil doesn't deliver people from evil. Prisons don't change criminals. Prisons execute punishment and that's necessary. It's justice. God teaches that. But what brings change is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What brings change is the blood of Jesus Christ. Is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not laws. It's not legislation. And it's not somebody in high office. And it's not a dollar. It's the gospel. But this gospel shouldn't stay there. It has to flow out into the Dead Sea. So the first thing, we are not tombs, we are temples. Meaning we're not going to live based on what God used to do. The best year spiritually, we're going to experience that now. Number two, the Holy Spirit wants to flow out. The Holy Spirit wants to create a river, a revival, a flow in our life. Out from here into there. Not from there into here. The model that so many people have, the traditional model of the church is this. You're truly revived if you faithfully attend church. Give and go to a small group. And that's good. Giving, faithful attendance is important. But that water doesn't flow in, it flows out. Jesus didn't say, if you believe in me, the rivers will flow in. He says, the rivers will flow out. So revival, let's redefine revival to I'm going to church to I am walking away now from the church filled with the Holy Spirit to live for Jesus' purpose in this world. Why? Because this world belongs to God. Right now it's occupied by the Prince of Air. But he's, he has already expiration date. The guy is not staying here for long. He's already been defeated and disarmed. He's already counting. There's a countdown. It's been set. The bomb is going to go off. And the bomb is going to hit his face, not yours. The end of age is his part, not ours. That's not the end of the world. God's going to make this world new and we're going to rule and reign with Christ. It's the devil's part. The devil's reign is coming to an end. We are in the enemy occupied territory, but Jesus is already the king and we're waging war. We're sabotaging his kingdom and we're not afraid of it. Why? Because our king has already defeated the devil, demons, hell and grave and he is coming back. <laughs> Lastly, the river grows fuller as it goes further. I want you to notice how the river increases. How do we see greater increase of the anointing, miracles and revival in our church? The river did not increase at the temple. The further it got from the temple, it got wider, gradually got deeper. 1,000 cubits is 1,700 feet. So every 1,700 feet, 
there was a gradual increase of the river. But I want you to notice in which direction the river increased. The river increased as the man walked in the direction of the lowest point on earth. The river increased as the man walked in the direction of the Dead Sea, the most deadest place on earth. As you walk in that direction, the river gradually increases. It started with ankles, then it went to the knees and then the waist and then he couldn't swim anymore. River gradually increased as we go to the lowest point on the planet. The secret to not only maintaining God's anointing on this house but growing it is this. It's not in our speed, it's in our direction. When the lost people, when winning the lost is the department of the church instead of the direction of the church we will not maintain the anointing. When the most important thing in the church becomes making sure we are in the right direction, what is that direction? But we want to be in God's will. Well, I can tell you where God's will is headed. If God wills that nobody perishes, but everybody comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. God's will, God's river, God's direction, you will receive power to make your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to all, to all of the earth. God made it very clear, my direction, where my power will flow, where my gifts will flow, where my glory will flow, where my provision will flow is the Dead Sea. If you stay in that direction, you will always be in my power. You will always be in my anointing and I promise you, I'll increase it gradually. I'll expand it gradually. Every 1,700 feet you will begin to see an increase. As you get closer and closer to more people getting saved, I will begin to increase the amount of miracles and more salvations, more healings, more reconciliations, more homes being rebuilt for God. Direction is very important. Hungry Gen has a direction. That direction is to win souls. And to make disciples. Our mission is that. Everything else is not sacred. How we do that vision and mission can change. One thing doesn't change is that mission. When this church was started, it wasn't started as an aquarium of exotic Slavic fish. It wasn't started to preserve tradition. It was started to save the lost. When we didn't speak no English, didn't understand the culture and were still on welfare. We just came as refugees here. That vision was made very clear from the beginning. That vision scared people. Because how can you do that in the United States? This won't work. This was 20 years ago. You're sitting here today because the church had the direction. Which means my comfort your convenience is not priority. This church exists for the reason for which Jesus came, bled and died. Maturity is defined not by how much gifts you have, but how close you are to the reason Jesus came on this earth for. Do you live for that purpose? Our giving is toward that direction. The new building is for that purpose. Going into school is for that purpose. Everything has to some way, shape and form. Go to the Dead Sea, the lowest point on the earth. Deliverance is for that purpose. Salvation is for that purpose. The healing is for that purpose. Cell groups is for that purpose. Destiny training is for that purpose. It's not a purpose unto itself. It has a point and the point is the direction that God has said in His Word. We can change the direction. The river is not moving because I'm telling it where to move. I have to follow the flow where the river is moving. And God made it very clear. The river is moving to the point of the lowest point on the planet. Broken, hurting, lost, backsliding people who don't know Jesus are the reason Jesus came is the reason why he died and it's the reason he gave us the Holy Ghost it's the reason he gave us the church and it's the reason God will give us whatever we need to get to the lowest point on the planet as long as hungry Jen keeps salvation of people the most important thing and is willing to make whatever sacrifices whatever changes we need to make to see more and more people come to Jesus Christ we will never lack the anointing of God we will have the amount that we need for the assignment that God has given. We'll be praying for more 100% but it's not so we can be powerful. It's so that we can fulfill our purpose. Amen. Let me give an example of just few people that, a secular, ver a secular uh, people who have lived that as uh, saving people. 
uh, Chen Si is called the angel of Nanjing. His, there, was a, there was this bridge in China and the China actually has the most, has more deaths by suicide than any country in the world. Uh, Nanjing uh, Jiangxi River Bridge is actually the most popular site for suicides on record. They actually beat the uh, San Francisco Bridge. Um, so this is, China is the most country that has the most suicide. This bridge is the top place for the suicides in the world. In 2003, um, Chen Si saved a man's life after grabbing him from the railing and tackling him to the ground. He would actually drive taxi and see people jump, sometimes stop his taxi, run across a four-lane highway, grabbing somebody from ending their life. After this incident in 2003, he actually, every weekend for 18 years, volunteered to scout two mile length of this metal expense, talking to hundreds of people, thinking about taking their lives. This wasn't a nonprofit. This wasn't a job. It's just on his day off, he took a whole day, 18 years, to talk to anybody that's walking on this bridge in case they're planning to end their life. In fact, a few years after that, he moved his house. He built a small house next to the entrance of the bridge where he, was, where he lived for the past 11 years. As of 2021, he saved 412 people. He rescues one person every two weeks. When they asked him a question, he said this, in the past, I didn't have the ability to protect myself to save other people. The people I wasn't able to save returned to haunt me in my dreams. This is not a job and I don't think he's a Christian. He simply saw people ending their life and refused to be careless about it and said, I want to do something to save somebody's life. Dedicated his weekends. Today he's called the angel of that bridge and the angel of that river. Let me tell you about Don Ritchie. He's in Australia. Don Ritchie is called the angel of the gap. The gap is an ocean cliff at Sydney. is a popular visitor destination that has gained infamous, uh, it's, it became infamous as a suicide spot of the, uh, for the years. It's estimated that about 50 people end their lives there every single year. Don Ritchie was a seaman in Royal Australian Navy. In the Sydney, he worked in insurance. Since 1964, he has saved 160 people, though his family says he saved over 400. He says, I was a salesman for most of my life and I sold them life. This is how he would save people. He lives next to the cliff. He would come to people standing there. He would know why they are there. Most likely not to observe the view, but to end their life. He would come up and say, can I help you in some way? The second question he would ask is, why don't you come and have a cup of tea? He says, more than not, quiet approach worked. Though on some occasions, I risked my own life by physically restraining the more determined from making their final leap. Afterwards, he would invite them back into his house for a cup of tea and a chat. Occasionally, they would return years later to thank him for saving their life. Don Richard said this, my ambition has always been to just let them away from the edge, to buy them time, to give them the opportunity to reflect and give them the chance to realize that things might look better the next morning. He said this, you can't just sit there and watch them. You've got to try and save them. A simple conversation of an elderly man and saved his family says about 400 people. He passed away already. My question today for us, we in each way, in our own way, are all living next to the bridge where the most deaths happen every day. You are living next to a cliff where every day somebody steps into the abyss, into the unknown, into the lake of fire. You're living there. You're working there. 
you're driving there, you're drinking coffee there, you're working out there, you're getting your degree there. My desire today isn't to guilt trip anybody. My desire is this, is to refocus you and I that we live with intention and not being cold, callous, blind or deaf to the cries and the plight of the people around us. The direction of the church, the direction of every Christian is to live for the purpose Jesus died for. Jesus died so that every person can encounter the love of God. He gave His life for that. All He asks us, He doesn't ask you to die for people. He's saying, could you live for that which I died for? Could you live with intention, with the purpose? Because life without purpose has no point. On the September 16th, 1976, on his usual 12 mile run with his brother Kamo, because when we were driving by this they told us because I've heard about this story I've never seen it until I was there in Armenia and it's confirmed to be true on his 12 mile run with his brother a trolley bus carrying 92 people fell into the side of freezing water that bus was about 80 feet offshore and 33 feet deep so when Shavar saw that as a champion who wins these competitions in swimming he quickly responded by jumping into the water he would spend 30 to 35 seconds for each person that he would save he pulled 20 people and only 20 survived he had so much glass and dirt inside that he he swallowed because even getting in there he had to break the back window of the bus with his legs and it was freezing cold water and so he got a lot of stuff into his lungs he actually went unconscious and went into a coma for 40 days after that he never performed again in his life in fact a few years later he did exactly the same thing in Moscow jumping into a burning building and rescuing people and then end up again in an ER for days they interviewed him after a few years because nobody knew about this until the newspapers came out that he saved this many people. They interviewed him and they said, so tell me about that day when you were going through this stuff, rescuing people. You know, his brother would resuscitate them on the shore and he would go in, take 20 seconds, pull one out and then bring them in, pull one out. And the last time he brought one person, he collapsed and they had to admit him to ER where for 40 days he was unconscious. He says, I knew that I could barely save so many lives. I knew that I could only save so many lives. I was afraid to make a mistake. It was so dark down there that I could barely see anything. During one of my dives, I accidentally grabbed a seat instead of a passenger. I could have saved a life instead. That seat still haunts me in my nightmares. Now, the direction of the church is for us to be witnesses and to live with intention is for people to be saved is for people to be rescued there's some things we can do it starts with the soles of our feet that speaks of winning souls for Jesus feet meaning where we go be intentional about who you talk to every person is fighting a battle you don't know we're not offering religion we're offering life and hope we're offering life so walk with your feet this week walk in the river meaning live a life of prayer but walk start with your feet the river has to hit your ankles meaning where you and I if you really want to start experiencing greater anointing live with intention don't just do life live with intention after that it has to hit your knees this means when we lead somebody to Jesus we gotta help them to stay connected we gotta bring them to a life group we gotta connect with them you can't just lead them to the Lord and leave them alone like that the only children they get left in the hospital and don't come home are the sick children. God doesn't want sick children. He wants children that have a home, have a home group, a life group. Somebody that they're connected to. Somebody that consolidates them, follows up on them. Can somebody say amen? The third thing is that we have to then disciple them. Discipleship is different than the follow-up. Follow-up is you praying in for them, praying through for them. And then discipleship is now they're learning how to fast, how to witness to other people. They go through destiny training. They get empowered now to be disciple makers. But God has one more stage. He wants every Christian who becomes a brand new Christian, gets followed up, gets discipled to become a disciple maker. 
And that's when, when we all begin to do that, we will get to a place we can't walk anymore. We're going to have to swim. This is what statistics says. A pastor who wins 10,000 people every month will win the world in 60,000 years. But a pastor who wins two people every month and teaches them to do the same will win the world in 30 months. Which tells me, win, follow up, disciple and then release them. That is biblical way of us to turn believers into disciples, disciples into disciple makers. You might not feel like being a leader. That is not the point. The point is that do you, can you love somebody? Can you care for somebody? Can you follow up on somebody? Can you open your mouth and talk to somebody about Jesus? When they say yes, could you put them in your prayer list and pray them through? Could you bring them to your small group? Could you sign them up for destiny training? Could you encourage them to become disciple makers for God? Can somebody say amen? amen. Say, I will win souls. I will make disciples. Who will make disciples? This is Jesus' strategy. Jesus didn't tell us go into all the world and make decisions. He didn't say go into all the world and ask people to raise their hand and pray a sinner's prayer. He says go into all the world and I want you to win. I want you to pray them through. I want you to disciple and for them to make more disciples and do that in every nation. This is not just about building a bigger church. It's about building better, bigger people The win souls and make disciples. Do you see that poster? Every believer a disciple maker. Oh but, but I'm not called to do that. Are you a believer? I don't know if I am educated enough. Have you noticed that when you have children, when you get married and you have children, you don't have a certificate on how to have children. You just have love and when you got love, you got them babies. Even a lot of you, you got children and you're still a child yourself. <laughs> Act like a child, immature, broke, but it doesn't matter. You got love and you got children. Yet when we become Christians, some of us, we say, no, I cannot spiritually help other people to come to know Jesus. Why? I need 20 years to be in the church. You didn't say I need to be 20 years to be married before I have children. No, some of you got it right away and some of you, you had children before you got married. Lord have mercy. That's another sermon for another day. We're going to leave that right now. <laughs> but right now, what I want to encourage you is this, is that none of us disqualify ourselves from having children just because we quote unquote don't have a degree in it. We don't have a lot of finances. No, we're in love. We want to see a family and then we get them kids. We grow. They change us. We, ch we change their diapers. They change our attitude. We begin to grow in that. We mature. We make mistakes, but we love those kiddos. They grow up. They have their own family. That's exactly how God wants spiritual family to be. Every Christian being a believer who becomes a disciple, who becomes a disciple maker. And the river grows as we all go. Not just the pastor in a sermon once a year, but the whole church moves in a direction. We go to the life class, we go to the destiny training, we go to cell groups and we go about our life winning souls and making disciples. Why is that important? So the church can get bigger? No, so hell can get empty. So Jesus can slap that devil and say, ha! I want not only on the cross but all of your spoil. I will take back what you stole from my kingdom. Why? Because my children full of the Holy Ghost will go into the enemy's camp and take back what the enemy has stolen. And we will see thousands locally and millions globally. We will see our conferences at Toyota Center. We will not be a church that has home groups. We're going to be a church of home groups. We are not going to be a cruise ship where everybody's there for pleasure and few people serve. We will be a warship that has a mission and every hand is on the deck. Our income today will become our tithe tomorrow. We are not just going to be adding more services. We're going to be adding more campuses. Okay, most people, whoa, what is that? Because God is going to spread His kingdom and He's going to move forward. We're going to see the music come out of this house. That's not going to come out because our musicians are potheads, like a lot of musicians are, but because our musicians, when souls make disciples, pray fast and see God. And you will feel the aroma being released in this house. 
the books that will become New York bestseller for the glory of God and people will be trying to figure out how did that happen out of that Tri-Cities and nobody knows them and nobody signed them up but there will be a favor and the grace of God because the river increases when we go to the Dead Sea when we build our brand when we build our name God doesn't increase the anointing but when we live for the fame of His name Jesus will increase the anointing. Somebody rise to your feet and give God some praise right now.